And the truth is, when we accept Christ, let me tell you, and this is the, just the way that it is, your debt is paid for, the grips of hell no longer have any power over you, you, you have Jesus Christ living in your heart that has conquered death, hell, and the grave, and you are victorious in Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, yeah. that's the truth. But you know where it gets people, where people back off and they get really confused? But this does not change the reality of the fact that you are still made of flesh. Do you get that? Saved, born again, love God, sing, praise His name, go to church every Sunday, and you are still made of dirty, low-down, rotten flesh. And the Bible says that I know that within me, that is within my flesh, lieth no good thing. I'm not saying that I'm not good or worth anything anymore because I am. I, I, I am a child of God. I, I am, my dad is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Okay, so I'm not brushing any of that aside. Not at all. But here's the thing that a lot of Christians don't understand. You can be saved and still not totally delivered from sin that's still in your flesh. Got quiet on that one. So, well, wait, wait a minute, you just said that I'm, I'm saved, I'm born again, all this. Yes, you are on your way to heaven, and there's nothing that can change that. But here's the thing. There are good people that go to church every single week, and they struggle with pornography on a level that is indescribable to other people. There are good-hearted people that sit there and go to church and go down the altar and stand up and then end up back in the bar on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, even though they said, Lord, this is it, I'm going to do better. There are people that have problems with their mouth and gossip and pride and everything else that have said, this is it, I am done, I'm not going to talk about people anymore, and you find yourself doing it two days later. The Bible says in Galatians 5, and I'm going to ask you to turn to Hebrews 12, which will be our passage this morning, but in Galatians 5, 19, I just want to read this now, just so you know, and it goes on and on and on, I just want to read some of it. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, are made known this way. And these are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, and the list goes on and on and on and on. And Christians that sit there and say, you know what, I was raised in church and I was raised in a good home and I've been saved and I know God, but I cannot get victory over this area of my life to save my soul. I cannot get a grip. They almost feel cheated or lied to or something. Because they don't understand that believers can still struggle with their flesh. Christians can still have addictions. Let me take you to the Bible. I'm going to just, you say, well, give, give me illustrations of this. Actually, the whole Bible is an illustration of this. I, no joke, we always talk about... The, the, the warriors and the heroes of the faith. Let me tell you, every hero has a story of failure. Do you guys ever notice that? Every story. I, I can bring you to Abraham. And Abraham was a man that, that was labeled as being a friend of God. But at the same time, Abraham was a man recorded numerous times of having a lying problem. He got into a tight spot. You know what he did? He called his wife his sister so he wouldn't get in trouble. Uh, to the point where he almost got himself killed from his lying. You take Moses. He was a hero of the faith. He's somebody that we lift up. He got so mad that he smote the rock and did all this. And God said, I'm not going to let you into the promised land. What about David? A man after God's own heart that had such a lust problem. That he ends up taking some woman that is not his. And killing her husband over his lust let me go on. I could list Samson. I could list Thompson. Thomas. I don't know who Thompson is. <laughs> don't you people read your Bible. It's in there. <laughs> I know what I'm talking about. My wife's giving me that look. I, I get this mental picture, and I want you guys to get this mental picture this morning. I, I, see, I read the Bible of different stories. Things that the Bible says for Christians to be rooted and grounded in love. To be rooted and grounded in love. And I get that principle. God's love or the word of God ought to come into our lives in such a way that it's not shallow. 
It's not just a matter of, oh, I can quote John 3.16. Well, good for you. It's a matter of, are you living John 3.16? Is it in your heart? Has it, has it gone down inside of your life and taken effect of different areas of life? Are you rooted in Christ to the point where when a storm comes in, you're not going to blow away just because something negative came into your life? And then I started thinking about that same principle when it comes to sin. Let's look at this first. I want to look at the rooted sin. On my day off, my house, I take Fridays off, and uh, one of the things that I do is I, I don't have any flower beds at my new house. I, I still have a construction zone outside, but my old house, I had these flower beds that went around the front of my house. I would cut the grass. I would edge the grass. I would do all those things. I would power wash. I, I liked the outside of it looking nice the best that I could. And then I was, I was big. I love that contrast. And some of you guys know what I'm talking about. I love the contrast of the grass meat and the black mold. You guys know what I'm talking about? And maybe I'm just weird about this, but I, I wanted there to be a clean line right there. And I would get down and I would edge it. And then when I was done, some of the grass would blow up inside the, the black. And then it would die and there'd be all these little brown pieces. And I did not like that. So when I was done, I'd get on my hands and knees and I would just, I would shake it all up and it would turn the black more black because it'd stir up the stuff that was underneath. And then it would look really good. Well, I, while I'm doing that, I'd find all these little guys, these little evil people that would sneak in, these weeds that would crawl up through my mulch. But my thing with my, I'm giving you guys some lessons here. If you take some lessons here, it could help you. I do the mulch so sick that I knew it was thick that they could not get through that. But some of those things would go through. Weeds are powerful. I don't know how, but they're able to get through. And I'm, I'm crawling around on there, and I'm pulling all these things out as I'm going. I'm just going to pull them out. And then I, I put the mulch right over, and I'm, I'm making it look good. I go back out there. Grass has not grown all the way. Tuesday, Wednesday, by Thursday, I look out there, and I go, what in the world is that? Those same weeds are back there. And I mean, they're not gigantic, but I mean, they're already sticking out. I'm thinking, wait a minute, I just pulled you out. I pulled you out. I took care of you. I, I took care of that. And they're still there. The problem was still there. The problem came back. And the thing is, it didn't require effort. I didn't have to water it. I didn't have to put miracle Grow on it. It just naturally happened. Weeds naturally come back when the root is still in the ground. Still there. And then it hit me. Hebrews 12.1. Hebrews 12, I want, I want you guys to look at this with me. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. And I have preached on that part right there. But it goes on to say, and the sin was so it doth easily beset us. And the sin which doth so easily beset us. That that sin, that, that you know, where you're going there and it, it, it comes back and it comes back. And it's, it's, it's one of those things as we're running the race that the Bible talking about. So let us run the race that is set before us out of the verse. Enter, that one sin that seems to trip you up over and over and over and over and over again. It's a thing that when you put it to death... And you rip the head off of it and you smooth it over and you go to your spouse and you say, I'm done with that. I'm not going back. I cut it off. I deleted that. I'm not looking again. I am done. I am sick of it. And in your mind and in your heart, you're saying, I don't want it anymore. Two weeks later, it's right back in the same ugly spot. Notice how specific it is in this. And the sin, which doth easily beset us. It, it made me think of that, that thing that keeps coming back or that keeps besetting us or keeps knocking us down. And you don't have to turn there. But I, I want you to think of that with James chapter 1 verse 15. James chapter 1 verse 15. I think it's on here. Then l listen to this. And I want you guys to get this. Len, then when lust hath, what's the word? Conceived. When lust hath conceived 
Now, this can be different in every person here. And just so you know, I'm not overlooking anyone. We're sitting there going, oh, today they're talking about the recovery group and what God is doing, the testimony, and thank God for how they're working. Let me tell you, just because your besetting sin might not be alcohol doesn't mean that you don't have one. And for you to sit back and say, well, thank God it's not drinking. Well, you know what? One person's might be drinking and yours might be something else. But it doesn't mean you're above it. But when the lust hath conceived, that lust or that word conceived means to grab a hold of, to take part. When that lust has got into your heart, it conceives, it grabs a hold of your heart. It seems to be rooted inside of your life. It's there. There's a lot of sin that we bring into our life. There are things that we'll do and I'll get upset and get mad and say, God, please forgive me. I didn't do that. And I could go the rest of my week and never once have a problem with getting mad or something you say or something you do or getting upset at somebody. You know what we do? We, we, we pray and we get it cleaned up. I'm not talking about those things. I'm talking about that one that has been there since you've been a teenager. I'm talking about that one that you've been covering up every since the day you were married. I'm talking about the one that seems to haunt you down even though you cry yourself to sleep and say, I wish I would stop. When you get busted by a Christian friend that says, I can't believe you were talking that way. I can't believe you're, 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 you're talking about so-and-so. I can't believe you brought that up. And so I know I, I'm trying to stop. I don't mean to. It's just inside of me. I don't mean to do this. Some people that that sin keeps getting repeated. The thing that, you, that gets stuck in your head, that image that keeps playing back over and over again, that language that you're around that seems to just come out of your lips whether you're thinking about it or not. And a lot of times it, if you're looking at the history, it gets traced back to that con- conception point. Somewhere in your life where that weed or that seed of that weed got planted down in your heart. Some people say, you know, I never had a problem until I went off to college and I started being around friends. And I drank socially, but I'll tell you what, I never dropped it. I work with these guys at work and they, 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 they cuss like sailors. And I get in that break room and I start talking to them and all of a sudden it's in my mind and I talk that way. I, I, I get, some people told me that I grew up in a, in a house that my mom and dad argued and they, they pitched a fit about everything and they blew up. And now I'm finding myself do the same thing. I tell my husband every time, I'm sorry, I get so mad. And I'm, I, I tell the kids, Mommy, sorry that I get so mad and I shouldn't yell and I shouldn't cuss and I shouldn't do that. But I don't know what it is. I can't seem to shake that rooted sin in my life. And it just seems to get a hold of you. And years later, time passes, it's still there. Even asking God to heal and repair. And men that get busted with their sin. And women that get confronted with their sin. You know what I realized with this? Just like that weed. You know what we usually do with our sin? We, we rip off the part that's noticeable to everybody else. But we never really deal with the issue. I'm just being honest. What I have found, the easy thing to do, it's easier to confront the part that people see because we try to cover up what's making us look bad. Honey, you know what? I'm going to do better. I'm just going to control my tongue. And man, you might cuss, you, you might cuss like a sailor out in, the, uh, out, out in your car or out in the garage or when you're at work. But man, you're going to try to cover it up. Let me tell you, you can do that. But that means that it's still in your heart. Just because you're not dragging it into the house and the beer's not in the fridge and the dope's not in the cover, and nobody knows about it, you hid it from mom and dad, doesn't mean that you fix the sin that so easily besets you in your life. It's still rooted in there. You are saved. That sin cannot remove your salvation. It absolutely cannot keep you from heaven. It does not overcome your redemption that you have through Jesus Christ. But I tell you what it sure can do. It can ruin your testimony and make you feel miserable in this life. And that's the truth. So I take you from this rooted sin to this reigning sin. And that's not me just trying to be creative in in an outline. The Bible talks about in the same passage, let us lay aside every weight in the sin that so easily, so easily besets us. It does not have to try very hard. Then all of a sudden you're right back to yelling like you were. You're right back to those websites like you were. You, you catch yourself in those lies even though you say you're not going to lie to her anymore. 
you're sneaking behind your wife, you're, you're, you're stopping off at the bar, you go, you say, man, I didn't even try, I didn't, it wasn't premeditated, I, I, I never intended to do that, it just happened. See, what happens is that sin, that root, it's getting down to areas of your life and your thought process and, and, and it's changing things of your life and it's being attached to other areas of your life, you don't even realize what it's doing. You know what sin does? It begins to reign in your life. It begins to rule in your life. It does. You'll start doing things you never thought that you would ever do. Just ask David. I'll tell you, when David took that woman, he thought, man, this is fun, and I think she's this and that, or whatever, but he never foresaw himself calling his good-hearted men that follow God to go murder somebody. Rooted sin begins to reign in your life. Let me tell you, that is why that sin will stick around in your life. That is why that's that one sin that will be there years later. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6 verse 12, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. That word reign is exactly what we're talking about, to take control. Let's read it. Let, let not sin therefore reign in your flesh. That ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield you your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. But yield yourselves unto God. As those that are alive from the dead. And your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law but under grace. But notice these words that were said in this, that ye should obey it. You know, you know what I'm saying? At some point, that sin, just like it, it reminds me of that visual picture of Samson. You guys know Samson, one after another. If you tie me with this, if you tie me with new ropes, if you tie me with green vines, if you do this. And you know what he did? He broke out of it every single time. Until one day, sin took him further than he ever planned to go. And next he lost the power of God and he's tied this time with chains and he's in that mill. This time he rose up to try to break them off and there was no breaking those chains at this point of his life. Those chains began to control him, lead him and bind him down even though he had the power of God all that time. Because sin will take you further than you want to go and it gets you to the point where you have to obey the sin that you're chained to. Christians that say, you know what, I have no desire. I am not going to do this anymore. Well, the thing is, that drug, that drink, that, that pornography, whatever it is, is so deep-rooted in your heart, you don't just turn around and walk away from it. It will pull that chain back and say, no, you belong to me. It happens all the time. It's amazing how people will get into this position in their life. And they won't understand why. And eventually, you know what we do? We just get used to it. It just becomes part of it. My dad was a drunk. I'm a drunk. That's just the way it's going to be. That's an excuse. You see, here's what the Bible says. Hebrews 12, 1 again. Let us. You know what that was meaning when God says let us and he tells us to do things? What God is about to say, it means that it is very, very possible when God says, let's come together to do this. Lay aside the weight and the sin which so doth easily beset us. You know what God said? Hey, guys, come together. You know, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to tell you guys right now how to lay aside the sin. You know what the, the phrasing there of let us means? It is a choice. It is a choice. And you say, you just don't have no idea. The Bible says in Romans 6, 12, the same passage, the same word is there at the beginning. Let not, the same let, meaning it's an option, send therefore reign in your mortal body. So let's hit it right now. And I tell you what, if you've not taken notes and you've, you've kind of just said, okay, I'm just going across, along for the ride right now. I don't know what the besetting sin is in your life, but I want to give you from God's word the principles of how to overcome it. And let me tell you right now, the principles that we're about to go through in God's word right now is not saying for two seconds that this is going to happen tomorrow. I am not saying that you're going to walk out of here and that everything's going to fall apart, that you're going to say a prayer, stand up and not have a drug addiction or not have an alcohol or pride or a lying or a lust or whatever the case might be. Can we just hit it all while we're here? Is that okay? 
Do you ever notice we, we're in church and we don't want to offend anybody, do we? Or whatever. Do you know over doing anything in a lot of areas of our life, and let me just say it, even overeating is a sin. <gasps> Baptist preacher just said it. <laughs> yes. Do you, do you know why a lot of people call us hypocrites? Because we'll jump on all the sins that we don't do and we'll skip all the ones we do. You're, you're besetting sin in your mind. Life might be the just simply fact that you're Downer Betty, or you just Downer Debbie, not Betty. <laughs> They're sisters. I get them confused. I sure hope we don't have sisters with those names. <laughs> I know some Christians, that their, their besetting sin in their life is they're just fearful or negative about everything. And I'm just saying as we go through these, don't write off everybody that sits there and says, well, I'm not a, I don't drink and I don't smoke and I don't hang with those that do and all those other stuff. No, I'm not talking about that, but I'm telling you, there's areas of your life that need to get out just like they have. Don't put yourself in another category. Let's look at removing sin from our lives. How do we conquer sin from our lives? Here's the first thing that we do. We must confront the sin. We must confront the sin. You know what I'm going to tell you guys? Here's what it is. Call it what it is. Call it what it is. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. It's amazing how we will go through life and we'll sit there and justify things that we have in our life. And we'll sit there and label it. God has labeled these things that he has put in his life or put in the word of God. He comes out and he said, that is sin. And yet we'll label it everything under the sun. So we must confront the sin. If we say that, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, then we make him a liar and this word is not in it. This word is not in us. We identify the sin according to God's word. We don't, we don't label sin. God has labeled our sin. It is no joke. We must confront our sin. Here's the next thing. We must eliminate excuses. Quit justifying it. You know, one of the number one reasons why so many Christians keep living on in the sin of whatever they have, they step back and here's the thing that they'll say over and over again. Well, I was raised in a home that did that. It's so ingrained in my mind. You don't understand. My, my, my wife knows how to, I, I have a bad temper, but my wife knows how to push my buttons. You know what you're doing? You're just shifting the blame on somebody else. Why don't you be a man and be accountable for your own actions? Quit blaming society. Quit blaming your parents and say, man, I grew up in a home that all my parents did was cuss and all they did was this and all they did that. And I'm here to tell you that our God is bigger than whatever your past was. He is bigger than whatever that problem was. But you label it, you call it this and you would say, well, I have a stressful life and I was this and I was that. And we have an excuse for everything. Quit making excuses for it. See, the Satan will give you excuses all day long. He'll t keep telling you why you don't have to do that, why this is okay. I drink because I'm stressed. I only lied to you because I didn't want to hurt you. I, I, I cheated at work and I, I'm on the time clock because they deserve it and they, they're constantly ripping me off. Sin is sin. The Bible says, therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. Right is right and wrong is wrong. Here's the third thing. We must remove the sin by bringing it to God. Stop right now. And I want you to think right now in your mind. What is the besetting sin in your life? You think about it. Don't, don't yell it out. Just say it to yourself. What is the besetting sin in your life right now? Husband? Wife? Teenager? What is it? And here's the thing. The Bible says, if we confess our sins. Here's, here's how we do that. We expose the sin. Just like that weed, when we confess our sin, we get down on there. And, and, and I realized when, when they kept growing back, I got a little shovel and I began to dig around it. And the more I got around it, I realized that while my sin was just not me lying, it is pride that I have in my life. I am so prideful that I can't admit when I'm wrong. You know what? I dig a little deeper and I realize that it's not just pride, it's arrogance. I don't want to tell my wife that I'm wrong. 
I dig a little deeper and I realize that we cover our sins and we do all these things because of our self that we try to build ourselves up and we keep that covered on purpose. It's not that you'd never wanted to deal with it. It's just that you don't want to change. You don't want to pull it out. Expose the sin. Call it whatever it is. Pray specifically. Bring it to God. It's so funny how people think that they're going to get victory over sin in their life by saying, dear God, help me with my sin. That's a bunch of junk. I I am being completely honest. Try doing that with your kids. Have them come up and say, what did you do? Daddy, I did wrong. No, tell me, you you stole this, you broke this, this. You want them to acknowledge what they did wrong. Do you think it's any different between you and God? When God looks down at that man and says, no, I want to hear it. Lord, I have a lust problem. Lord, I have a lying problem. Lord, I have a self-discipline problem. Lord, I am sorry, but I lied to her again. I did this again. Lord, I have a drinking problem. Tell God what it is. The Bible says, if, I, F, at the beginning of it. You know what he's saying? If you do this, if you confess your sin, a lot of people are trying to get victory over their sin, and they never call it out to God. Whatever that besetting sin is, you need to bring before God. God, I am a liar. God, I am a thief. God, I have done this for years. God, I can bring it back in my history. God already knows, but God wants to know that you acknowledge it for what it is because you cannot address it, you cannot fix it, you cannot remove it if you do not acknowledge it in your life. Pray specifically. Make restitution. At the root, we find areas that are connected to our sin in a lot of ways because sin has something evil effect. It spreads. And over time, we hurt so many people. We have hurt our spouses. We have hurt our friends. We have hurt our testimonies. It's amazing the healing that God begins to bring in that area. When you go to your boss and say, the reason why I've been late so often, the reason why I've let you down is simply because of the fact that I've got this problem in my life and I need to deal with it. I have robbed from you. I have robbed from my kids. Kids, I am sorry. Will you forgive daddy for this? I am sorry that I have an anger problem. I'm sorry that I have a lust problem. I'm sorry that I have that. And make it right. So funny. We'd be quick on it to sit there and say, all right, go to your sister and make it right. You you go to school and you're going to go to that friend and you're going to make it right. But you know what? For some reason, when we get to adults, we grow out of that. You know what the Bible says over and over again about the unity of the saints and forgiveness of the saints and bear you one another's burdens and if there's fault one with another that we confess our sins one to another. You know what God is saying? You make it right. Here's here's the other aspect of it. Not only make restitution, but the Bible tells us to create safeguards in our lives. The Bible says in Proverbs 4.23, keep or guard your heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. Here's the thing, if you realize that you are weak in an area, you are not strong enough to tackle that area by yourself. God has brought us into a community of believers that we're standing side by side and shoulder to shoulder with people that love us. Did you recognize the testimony when they're standing up there this morning giving their testimony? Thank God for the people that God brought into my life. You think that you're going to overcome that sin and some of you guys have some such a, a deep addiction to things in your life and you hold it yourself because of your pride. You will not overcome it till you swallow your pride and you stand up to get help with whatever you're dealing with. You know what? Your wife would be ecstatic to know that you finally admitted what you've been hiding on your laptop and your computer. Your husband would be thrilled to know that you finally were able to confess that to somebody to overcome that problem that has been bringing depression and problems into your life and your spiritual life over and over again. Create safeguards. You know how you do that? God, let me give you this. You need to learn to stay away. The Bible says you abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. If we were so serious about this when it came to whatever we're talking about, there are some friends that you need to learn to cut off in your life. I'm saying that because I love you guys. You get around some friends and they bring out the worst in you, and I don't care if they've been your childhood friends since the time you were 11 years old. If they are bringing you down and dragging you from God, it's time to cut it off. So whatever happened to reaching them and loving them, you can't reach them when you're being just like them. God has called us to be the light of the world. You know what light is? Light is different. When you sit there and they know that you're lying to your wife and you're lying to your boss and you're lying to everybody else, you are not different. You are not being a light to them whatsoever. There are some things that we need to cut off. 
Let me, let me tell our young people in here that you're in a relationship that you can't keep, seem to keep your hands off of them. Fornication is a sin in the eyes of God. Premarital sex is a sin in the eyes of God. Bible only gives one command and where it's okay, and it's called marriage. When you step inside that area and you do it, you are living in sin, and that sin will get rooted in your heart, and you will have problems later on in your marriage. So I can't believe you're saying that. I'd rather tell you now than in counseling later. We've gotten to the point where we dance around these issues and we don't want to offend anybody. Let me tell you, this is not offending anybody. If you take it to your heart, it will change your life if you take it to your heart. Abhor that which is evil. Stay away from it. Delete things on your computer. Get accountability. Learn to turn your head. Pull people into it. It is dragging you down. It is time to get up and say, you know what? If you hear me being negative, if you hear me gossiping, call me out on it. Create safeguards in your life. So I can't believe you're saying all this. I'm tired of Satan walking all over the Christian home. I'm sorry, I, I, I'm tired of Christians being drugged through 20, 30 years of an addiction when it is something that through the power of God you have the ability to overcome. Create safeguards in your life. Learn to stay away. Learn to stay away. And create accountability. The thing is, a lot of Christians fail because they try to do it alone. You know, it's, it's amazing when, when you sit there and you find other believers. Now, if you're going to find somebody that's just going to agree with you and say, oh man, that's not a big deal, that's not a true friend. You guys get that? That's not a true friend. Let me, let me tell some of our young people that you sit there and you struggle with thoughts. To the point of a big thing today is young people cutting themselves and all this other stuff and they... You need to open your mouth and create accountability in your life and realize that you're not alone with whatever that is. I say that to every man, woman, and child that's in this room right now. The Bible never, ever called us to bear the burdens. And let me tell you, that besetting sin in your life can be a burden in your life that keeps pulling you down. You were not created to carry it alone. Bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. The reason why I say this is we will celebrate our recovery group and we're going to keep pushing and we're going to keep doing it. We praise God for it. But there's besetting sins in every pew of this church this morning. There are sins that you've allowed just to conquer, control, reign, and manipulate your life. And it's only through the power of Jesus Christ that you'll ever have freedom and victory.